And hello, Seishem. My name is Evan Wiener, and thank you, Ali, for inviting me uh, to give this uh, little presentation on Title IX and when women got equal rights in higher education with men back in 1972. And this guy here, uh, Richard Nixon, the guy who I knew. In 1984, 1985, the Major League Baseball umpires had the dispute with the Major League Baseball owners and needed to go to arbitration. And Richie Phillips, who was the head of the Major League Baseball Umpires uh, Association, recommended to the baseball commissioner, Peter Ubroth, let's go to arbitration. Peter said, who should we get? And he said, Dick Nixon. And that's how I got introduced to Dick Nixon. I got to know him a little bit uh, over a four or five year period when he hung out at baseball games. But back in 1972, Richard Nixon made it possible for women to become doctors, lawyers, engineers. In fact, he changed the lives of hundreds of millions of American women and some women from uh, outside of the United States. Uh, Title IX, Title IX, the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act. And before I go on, I want to thank uh, a few people who helped me out with this talk. Donna De Verona, who won two gold medals in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics swimming. Uh, she uh, always helps me out on this. She is uh, an activist trying to make sure Title IX doesn't go away. Nancy Hogshead Maker, who is uh, now a law professor over at uh, Rutgers University. Uh, she also won a gold medal in swimming in 1984 at the Los Angeles Games. Uh, she has helped me out. Uh, Harvey Schiller, uh, who uh, was uh, in college athletics, was another guy who helped me out uh, with this talk as well as uh, the late Shelley Saltman, who in the 1970s, Billie Jean King's magazine, uh, Women's Sports Foundation, named Shelley one of the five most influential men who helped women's sports in the 1970s. So I have to thank those people before I go on. The Education Amendments of 1972 or Title IX. In 1971, Congresswoman Patsy Mink of Hawaii and Edith Green of Oregon uh, were in the house and they were given a chance to help other women pursue their dreams without gender discrimination in college and both uh, Mink and Green ran with it. It would go to the Senate and eventually Richard Nixon would sign it into law. But before we get to June 23rd of 1972 when Nixon uh, signed this into law, let's talk a little bit about women, education, and their place. The pre-1960s thinking, now this was in San Francisco at the uh, Musique Musique uh, Magnifique uh, over at the Fisherman's Wharf, and this was from November of 2019 when I used to be able to go travel. Um, and this old Nickelodeon, to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid telling you what you got to do, what you don't have to do. By the way, that thing still works. Uh, all of that stuff in that museum and, uh, or amusement center in San Francisco works. But to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. Um, June 23rd, 1972, there was no avoidance. Women were going to be educated on their own terms. June 23rd, 1972, Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress and is signed into law by Richard Nixon. The sponsors of Title IX are in the United States Senate, Indiana, Democrat Birch Bayh, and in the House, the Oregon Democrat Edith Green. Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program or activity receiving any type of federal aid. Now, let's go back to 1959, into a library. This library happens to be in West Orange, New Jersey, who's one of the last libraries that uh, actually uh, physically was in in 2020. And I was doing a, a Super Bowl talk uh, in the New Jersey Library. And uh, I was just, I had a couple of minutes, the place was closed, opened at noon. It was a Sunday uh, talk. And so I'm just waiting outside, just looking. And I looked at that, the West Orange Public Library Board of Trustees, when the place opened in 1959. And I noticed Mrs. Simon J. Griffinger, president. She didn't have a first name. 
Samuel A. Cristiano did, Roger W. Doring did, Herbert J. Dwyer did, but uh, Mrs. Katz, she didn't. She was known as Mrs. Alex J. Katz. The mayor of West Orange, James J. Sheeran, had a name, as well as the superintendent of schools, Dr. Rexford S. Souther and William E. Lehman, uh, was the architect of the place. Well, the men had names. The women didn't. Uh, if you wanted to be a stewardess, if you wanted to be a stewardess, check this out. Welcome aboard Delta, 1965. Stewardess applications. Well, the applicant must be between the age of 20 and 26. Never married. Radiant good health. Must adhere to strict figure control standards. 34, 24, 36 maybe? I don't know. Uh, but that would be strict figure control standards. Straight teeth. And you had to have smooth skin. Um, and willing to retire between the ages of 30 and 32 to take on the greater complexity of marriage. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like, you know, discrimination. Straight teeth, straight legs. That's what they wanted in you to be a stewardess. Uh, Alan Levin was the uh, host of the very popular game show that was on CBS in the afternoon. There is Alan Levin. Carol Burnett to his right, your left, Mitch Miller to his left, your right. And um, when a woman would come in, they would introduce her as either Miss or Mrs. Uh, and uh, if you were a Miss, Ellen London would ask you, are you a working gal? If you were a Mrs., what does your husband do for a living? But Patsy T. Mink would try to change all of that. Hawaiian Congresswoman. And um, she felt discrimination going back to the 1940s, playing basketball for Maui High School, because women were not allowed to run up and down a 96-foot or a 92-foot court, 96-foot court, 48 feet was all that uh, women in high school should be able to run because they were dainty, fragile things. And you didn't want women to be overtaxed and exhausted. That's why they only played half-court basketball. Patsy Mink had ability, but she was a woman. Patsy Mink was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School. She became the valedictorian of her graduating class in 1944. She went to the University of Hawaii, did a great job there, but couldn't get into medical school. She got into law school. I'll get I'll go back in a minute because I want to tell you more about Patsy Mink. Uh, she was politically ambitious in 1958. She was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. A year later, that was dissolved because Hawaii was becoming a state. In a special election, she ran for Congress and she lost in the Democratic primary to Daniel Anoyi. Uh, in 1962, she ran for election to the Hawaii State Senate. She was successful. Two years later, she ran for Congress. She was successful. She was an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress to use the all-male gym. They wouldn't give her the keys to the place. They wouldn't let her in. After all, she's a woman, she's dainty and delicate, and she can't handle things like lifting weights, right? She can't do that. That's not for her. But she decided she wanted to use the gym, and she was not denied. Mink was a champion of women's rights, but she avoided being characterized as a feminist. In the late 1960s, she became increasingly outspoken against the Vietnam War. In Congress, she worked tirelessly on behalf of legislation in the fields of civil rights, including those of women and children, as well as health care, welfare, and education. Now, let's go back a little bit in time to when she was about 22 years old, around 1948. After her college years at the University of Hawaii, she had the marks, she had the ability. She was a valedictorian at Maui High. She applied to medical school, but she was rejected 12 times because she believed it was gender discrimination. So she can't go to medical school, so she says, okay, let me try law school. And she did go to law school, but she faced sexism when she was denied a job at a law firm 
because she was a married woman. In fact, she had even more than married woman problems, rejection. She tried to start her own practice, but the government of Hawaii, the territory of Hawaii at that, that time, said that um, you're not really a resident of Hawaii anymore, even though you were born here, went to school here, because you married a mainlander. You married somebody from Chicago. Uh, so even though you were born here, raised here, Maui, Val Victorian, uh, your husband wasn't, so you're not a resident of Hawaii anymore. And because you're not a resident of Hawaii anymore, you can't take the bar exam. So she was discriminated against. A, medical school, and when she tried to start her law firm, they wouldn't allow her to take the bar exam. So she fought for her right to take the bar exam. She did eventually win that. Uh, she passed the exam. And she became the first Japanese American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. Uh, she represented Hawaii in the United States Capitol as a congresswoman from 1965 to 1977, from 1990 to 2002. And there are the two women who are very, very, very much uh, behind uh, what happened when Richard Nixon signed uh, Title IX into law on uh, Jan June 23rd, 1972. Patsy Mink on your left, Edith Green on your right. In 1954, Green was elected as the representative for Oregon's third congressional district. Uh, she focused on women's issues, education, social reform. Uh, in 1955, Edith Green, one of the first things she did in Congress was proposed an Equal Pay Act, which would ensure uh, men and women were paid equally for equal work. A uh, variation of that bill was signed into law under the Kennedy administration, with John Kennedy signing it in 1963, but it really wasn't uh, equal pay for equal work. Uh, to this day, uh, it still remains the same. Women do not get equal pay for equal work in many instances. And there's Edith Grand when she was running for Congress. Democrat for Congress back in the mid-1950s. She was also known as the mother of higher education, the Library Services Act, which provided access to libraries for rural communities, the uh, Higher Education Facilities Act of 1963, the Higher Education Act of 1965, 1967. She became known as the mother of higher education and Mrs. Education. In the late 1960s, she pointed out that programs were designed after school programs to keep boys in school, but girls really didn't have similar programs in a lot of areas. Uh, and she sought to correct this inequity. She helped to introduce a higher education bill that contained provisions regarding gender equality in education. Uh, that woman there, Kay Switzer, Kathleen Switzer, but she entered the Boston Marathon as Kay Switzer. And there is Jock Semple. He was the guy who ran the Boston Marathon. And if you look real carefully, it looks like Jock Stemple at that point, Semple rather, Semple, S-E-M-P-L-E, is about ready to knock over uh, Catherine Switzer, knock her to the ground, perhaps injuring her, scraping her up. Uh, fortunately, her boyfriend uh, was there to the left and uh, he was not somebody to be messed with. He was uh, a world-class uh, track and field athlete. Uh, Catherine Switzer grew up as the daughter of a major in the United States Army, so failure was never really an option for her. While studying in 1966 at Syracuse University, she told one of her coaches that she was gonna run the 1967 Boston Marathon. That coach said, uh, you're a fragile woman. You can't run that. You're fragile, you're dainty, you know? I never understood something. Uh, if women were the weaker sex or fragile or what have you, dainty, if they were the weaker sex, how come they outlive men? Anyway, so coach said, yeah, you can't do this. You can't run the Boston Marathon. So she trains in secret and enters the 1967 Boston Marathon. And there is a closer picture of uh, Jock Semple trying to get rid of uh, who he felt was Kay Switzer, uh, and he noticed that she was a woman, and there is the boyfriend uh, knocking Jock to the ground, allowing uh, Switzer to continue running. 
Uh, people who work the marathon try to physically pull her out of the race, possibly assaulting her. When the race official, Jock Semple, tried to remove her from the race, her boyfriend, who weighed 235 pounds, was a nationally ranked hammer thrower uh, who was running the race aside, uh, alongside her, pushed Semple to the ground. Uh, the fragile, dainty woman wasn't so fragile and wasn't so dainty. She finished uh, the 26 mile, 26 mile, 26.2 mile race in approximately four hours and 20 minutes. Title IX, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation and be denied the benefits of or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX was a highly controversial amendment. And although some supported the law, others said, hey, no, 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 I can't do this. It'd be way too dangerous to force schools to accept women because you know what? It's going to ruin American education. Imagine a woman here. That can't be. It's going to ruin education. Uh, there were some allies. There were some allies. Uh, Alaska Senator Ted Stevens was a big champion of uh, women's rights and also Title IX. Uh, he begins his career in 1952. His law career takes him to Fairbanks, Alaska, where he was appointed U.S. Attorney the following year. In 1956, he returned to Washington to work in the Eisenhower Interior Department, where he played an important role in bringing about statehood for Alaska. Alaska was the 49th state coming into 1959. He was elected to the House of Representatives in Alaska in 1964, Republican, and became the House Majority Leader in the second term. In 1966, he ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate, but was appointed to Alaska's other Senate seat when it became vacant uh, in 1969. As a senator, Stevens played key roles in legislation that shaped Alaska's economy and social development, including the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, the Transatlantic Pipeline Authorization Act, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, and the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and of course, Title IX. He was also known for his sponsorship of the Amateur Sports Act of 1978, which led to the establishment of the United States Olympic Committee, now called the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. The Alaska Statehood Act was signed by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. On July 7, 1958, Alaska would become a state in 1959 on January 3rd, the 49th state. It's kind of interesting that um, the two of the major forces behind Title IX came from two new states, Ted Stevens, Senator from Alaska, Patsy Mink, Congresswoman from Hawaii. And there is my friend Donna Deverona, Donna who won two gold medals uh, in the uh, 1964 Olympics as an amateur, tried to go to Stanford University, but they would not give her a scholarship uh, to Stanford University because even though she was a great swimmer, women just didn't get scholarships. It wouldn't be uh, until um, the 1970s, after Title IX was passed, that the first woman collegiate scholarship was ever given out to a basketball player by the name of Ann Myers. Now, this is what Donna told me a few years ago. Without Senator Stevens as a co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. And that law was challenged about two dozen times uh, because some people did not like the fact women could get equal educations. Uh, why Title IX? Why Stevens? Well, he was an active tennis player. He was able to see the value in sports and recreation reflected in both his personal and professional lives. Title IX provided women's equality in sports. And there is uh, Harvey Schiller, um, who uh, was uh, a major force in college sports in the 1980s. 
uh, Ted Stevens in the middle, and uh, Donna Dev Arona. Um, back in 1969, 1970, I went to Spring Valley Junior High School. I was in ninth grade in September of 1969 and got out of the, the junior high school in June of 1970. I had a ninth grade teacher by the name of Stewie Gates. Stewie Gates. Stewie is uh, still around. Uh, he's not teaching anymore. Uh, he works as, uh, with the Stony Point, New York Fire Department, a volunteer. And uh, until about seven years ago, because he's in his 90s now, until about seven years ago, uh, he was fighting fires until the other fire people said, uh, look, Stewie, uh, getting a little old, so, you know, maybe, maybe you don't need to run into burning building, but we need somebody to answer the phone, and he's still doing that. Anyway, I bring up Stewie Gates. Because in ninth grade, Stewie Gates uh, gave us one of those Dutch uncle talks, and I was a year ahead, so I was only 13 years old. Everybody else was 14. I was the baby of class. And uh, he starts talking about, well, you know, you're in ninth grade now, and next year you're going to be in 10th grade, and you're going to go to a new building, Spring Valley Senior High School, and you're going to take the PSATs, the practice SATs. And then in two years, you're going to take the real SATs, and that may determine where you're going to go to college, what kind of marks you get on it, all that stuff. And then in three years, you're going to start visiting colleges, and you're going to start looking uh, to see what college you want to go to and what you're going to major in. And for the girls in the class, the girls in the class, some of you are going to go to college to major in three letters. Now, when I'm live with people, I usually ask the question, what are those three letters? But I'm not live here. Uh, we're recording this. So uh, I will give you the answer. The answer is MRS. You're looking for a husband. So Birch Bay is uh, trying to get this thing through the Senate. And he's on the Senate floor. And I read the transcript. And I said, man, that's Stewie Gates talking. Sort of. Uh, Birch Bay authored and introduced Title IX of the Higher Education Amendments in 1972, which, for the first time, prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex in the classroom and on the athletic field, protecting both students and faculty. Uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not, did not allow women uh, or, or afford women the opportunity to get higher education on the same level as men. If they got something, they should feel lucky because women basically should be nurses and secretaries, teachers slash librarians. Uh, that was probably most of what women were allowed to do prior to 1972. There were a few doctors here and there. There were a few lawyers here and there, but few and far between. And there is a later picture of Birch by. So he's on the floor of the Senate, and these are the remarks Birch by makes. We're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things, Kay Switzer, who go to college, find a husband, and then go to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband, finally marry, have children, and never work again. Now, let me talk about some mindsets in the 1960s. I was, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, I was giving a, a talk at a uh, Stanford, Connecticut uh, senior residence. And there was a guy uh, who had gone to medical school in 1960. And he said, can I say something? I said, sure. I, yeah, I always listen. These are not lecture. I'm not talking down at you. I'm talking with you. It's a conversation. So I said, yeah, sure. He says, you know, I went to medical school back in 1960. He said we had 96 people in the medical school, 92 men, four women. And he said the, the, the dean of the school, we were all sitting down, said to the four women, will you please stand up, stand up. I want to say something to you. And he starts off by saying, why are you wasting our time? You're wasting our time because, you know, you're here. You, you, you may or you may not get the degree, but we know you're here partly to find a husband. That's what you're here for. Uh, 92 men, four women. So you're wasting our time. Then there was another guy. Uh, I was on a cruise ship a few years ago, and um, he was talking about his veterinarian class. And there were 
55 people, it's about 1965, 55 people in the class, about 45 men, 10 women, and the dean of the school uh, gets up and says basically to the 10 women, why are you here? You're taking a man's job. Uh, you're here looking for a husband. You know, those four women were taking men's jobs as doctors too in 1960. And he said, you know, and the 10 women were told, why are you here? You're wasting our time. You're gonna find the guy, get married, and we wasted 10 slots. But to make a long story short, um, we were on a cruise ship probably three years ago now. And he said, all 55 of us are still alive. We just went to a reunion recently. He says, and 45 of those guys are old farts like me, sitting on cruise ships, retired. Meanwhile, 10 women who were in that veterinary class or, or in that school are continuing to work. Seven of them went on to different areas of biology. Three are still veterinarians. Uh, boy, was that guy wrong. We're all retired and they're still working. They didn't take anybody's job. The stereotype, getting back to Birch Bay, the desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. But the facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex, and it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment, Title IX, would be far-reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America, something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the school skills they want, and apply those skills with the knowledge that they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. And with that, Bai concluded what he was saying on the Senate floor, and uh, Title IX would pass the Senate after it passed the House and would go up to Richard Nixon's desk and he would sign it on June 23rd of 1972. Title IX was enacted as a follow-up passage to the, uh, pa rather as a follow-up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which Lyndon Johnson signed into law July 7th, 1964. The 1964 Act was passed and discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in areas of employment and public accommodation. The 1964 Act did not prohibit, prohibit sex discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law in, in uh, academics. Women applicants were routinely denied equal access to medical law in graduate schools. Women athletes were denied equal participation in sports. That last sentence, Donna Deverona said we should never have thrown that last sentence in there because it really, really threw a monkey wrench into Title IX. Similarly, female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise of women in all academic disciplines and in sports at every level is in many ways a direct outgrowth of the landmark Title IX legislation. Congress finally passed the bill in June of 1972. Nixon would sign it into law. Yes, I did. Let me be perfectly clear about this. He signed it into law June 23rd. There have been many times in the last 40, 48 years now, 49 years, uh, when it's been challenged. Title IX has gone back to Congress many more times than most other laws, 24 times by 2007. I did sign the bill, and it would change the lives of hundreds of millions of women. He does sign the bill. But he says nothing when he signs it. Nothing. Just signs it, matter of factly. Goes on to other things. Speaks about the segregation, busing. Doesn't mention the expansion of educational access for women. He does it. He's the guy. Nixon's the one. Doesn't say a word about it. Women who are doctors now, lawyers, athletes, owe a great deal of debt to Richard Nixon. He did it. Nobody talks about it. 
Now, while all this is going on, there is a uh, housewife in Queens by the name of Bernice Guerrero, who's bored being a housewife. Um, in the 1960s, Betty Friedan wrote the book Feminine Mystique. It came out in 1963. And uh, it, it took six years, actually, for this idea that started in Betty Friedan's head to the book coming out. Betty Friedan went to uh, a reunion of Smith College uh, graduates in 1957, and she started talking to other graduates. And she found that, like her life, she lived in Rockland County, um, like her life, uh, a lot of these women felt empty, that they were missing something. They had no careers. They were just housewives. And she started to uh, collect stories, not only from the Smith College women, but from others, and decided to choose a magazine writer on the side, freelance magazine writer, and decided, hey, I'm going to try, and I am going to try and sell uh, all of um, these stories to a magazine. And she got turned down and turned down and turned down. No magazine wanted it. Finally, she said, let me see if I can write a book. And she puts it all into the book, Feminine Mystique, comes out in 1963. And that really is the start of the women's liberation movement in the United States. Uh, Gloria Steinem was part of that, and Bella Abzug part of that as well. Steinem in 1963 went undercover for a magazine called Show Magazine. And uh, she became a Playboy bunny and uh, exposed the life of a Playboy bunny in 1963. By 1966, the National Organization uh, of Women started. Anyway, this is Bernice Guerra, and she wanted to be a baseball umpire. She was sitting around discussing things with her husband, talking about she's bored being a housewife and not having anything to do. He says, well, what do you like? She says, I like baseball. And they started figuring out, well, what can I do in baseball? What can I do? And, and it dawned on them, I could become an umpire. Why can't I become an umpire? In 1969, Bernice Guerra received the contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League. She was going to become the first professional umpire in organized baseball in the 20th century. Uh, she received a telegram shortly thereafter from the NAPBL president, Philip Pitton, saying, hey, too bad. I don't approve your contract. You're gone. It's invalid. Well, she fights, and she fights, and she fights, and she fights, and she fights. And on June 24th, 1972, after three years of court battles, she finally gets onto the baseball field. She umpires a game in the, it uh, doesn't exist anymore, the New York Penn League, because baseball got rid of the short season rookie leagues um, just recently, so there'll be no New York Penn League this year. Uh, but she umpired a Class A minor league game, New York Penn League, between the Geneva, New York Rangers, Texas Rangers affiliate, and the Auburn, New York Phillies, uh, the Philadelphia Phillies affiliate in that league. And uh, there are only two umpires for these level games. One is behind home plate, and the other is out in the field because Major League Baseball didn't want to pay for more umpires or whatever group was paying for umpires. Um, she first is greeted by protesters at her hotel room that, you know, women's places in, in the home. And she gets to the stadium and people are complaining that she's out there. And then she gets into what is known as a baseball rhubarb, an argument with um, a manager. She was berated by the Auburn Phillies manager, Nolan Campbell, for reversing a double play call. Uh, that was game one of a doubleheader. Guerra resigned between games of the doubleheader, citing lack of co cooperation from her fellow umpires, although in this case, just one umpire that day, uh, and also uh, the fact that uh, there were demonstrations in front of her hotel. Campbell also said that um, Guerra should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. So she quit. She decided that was it. She had reached her goal, and she ended up with a job with the New York Mets in the front office after that. That's my father-in-law. It's about 35 years ago with Billie Jean King. Uh, I enjoyed 
hanging out with Billie Jean King. First of all, she's a very nice lady, although I wouldn't want to play tennis with her because I think she turns uh, into uh, it's Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Mr. Hyde on the um, tennis court. But she's a very nice lady and uh, she's fun to listen to and she always has great stories. Uh, Billie Jean King was a pioneer who captured people's attention long before the Battle of the Sexes showdown against Bobby Riggs at the Houston Astrodome in 1973. You might remember that made-for-TV extravaganza that Howard Cosell hosted on ABC TV. It's okay. I know. I knew Howard. I know his uh, grandsons, uh, Justin and Colin, and uh, Howard, for some whatever strange reason, actually liked me. I could never figure out why. But anyway, Billie Jean King. Getting back to Billie Jean King. Uh, while Patsy Mink was pushing ahead and trying to open up the uh, gym, congressional gym to women, and uh, Edith Green trying to get more extra uh, activities for, or extra activities for girls after school, uh, Billie Jean King was pushing for equal pay for women at tennis matches or, or tennis tournaments. Uh, in the 1960s, when uh, Billie Jean King started, women's tennis was stuck in old traditions that left women athletes as second-class citizens. Billie Jean King decided it was time to push ahead. In 1967, Billie Jean King took on the United States Lawn Tennis Association and its policy of paying top players under the table to guarantee their entry into tournaments. King denounced the U.S. LTA's practices as corrupt, and kept the game highly elitist. She was a troublemaker, but she got to good trouble as John Lewis, uh, the former Congress, the late John Lewis, the, the congressman from uh, Georgia who was part of uh, SNCC and the Civil Rights Movement. In fact, he was part of the Big Six in 1963. So he's pushing for civil rights. Around the time, Billie Jean King breaks into tennis professionally. 1968, Wimbledon, Billie Jean King won $750, yeah, 750 pounds worth of money. Sorry, it wasn't dollars, 750 pounds for taking the Wimbledon title while Rod Labor, Labor got $2,000. The total purses for the competition, 14,800 pounds for men, 5,680 for women, a, a little bit uh, more, a little bit less than a third. At the 1970 Italian Open men's single champion, Ily Nastassi of Romania was paid $3,500, while Billie Jean King, who won the Italian Open, got $600. The US LTA failed to organize any tournaments for women in 1970, maybe partly because they were very upset with Billie Jean King keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get equal rights in tennis. King pushed for equal prize money in the men's and women's games after winning the U.S. Open in, uh, well, it wasn't in uh, Flushing Meadow at the time, it was still in Forest Hills. Uh, she was paid $15,000 less than the men's champion, Nastasi, and she said, well, you know what? I'm not coming back here next year in 1973 unless the prize money is equal. Uh, the U.S. Open organizers gave in, and they became the first major tournament, the majors being the French Open, Wimbledon, and Australian Open. Um, the U.S. Open uh, in New York became the first tournament to equal, or rather offer equal prize money for men and women. And tennis, well, tennis is probably as well developed as any global sport in the world. Uh, except for soccer, maybe golf, and tennis has always had uh, women, uh, Thea Gibson before Billie Jean King, and Martina afterwards, Chris Everett, and uh, today um, uh, the Williams sisters, among others. Uh, four major championships in four different countries that attract the best men and women players in the world. And the Australian is in January, the French in May, Wimbledon in June, uh, the U.S. Open August, September, that's in non-COVID years, With COVID things changed around, and uh, separate tours for men and women globally, and there is some talk about combining the tours now, um, so we'll see what happens after uh, COVID 
um, is eradicated and uh, there's some semblance of normality sometime in the future. You've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You've got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. You might remember that 1969 commercial for Virginia Slims. It was condescending. No question about it. It was condescending. But yeah, the funny thing about that commercial, I was doing a talk at a library uh, up in um, Richfield, Connecticut, uh, a number of years ago, two years ago. And uh, a woman came up to me after the uh, talk and said, uh, it was a talk on 1969. She said, you know, I didn't use the product. But I'll tell you one thing. It was the first commercial that ever spoke to me as a woman. Uh, I didn't, it wasn't about washing floors or washing uh, uh, dishes or washing clothes. It was about a product, which I wouldn't use, but it was a product aimed at me. And uh, Virginia Slims, uh, Philip Morris decided to uh, sponsor the Virginia Slim circuit. You could see the tennis racket in one hand and the cigarette holder and the cigarette in the other hand. It was formed in 1970. The Virginia Slim circuit eventually became the basis for uh, the uh, women's tennis tour, eventually. Um, and there's a story behind this. Uh, in 1970, the players, they were dubbed the original nine, were dubbed against the United States Lawn Tennis Association because of the wide inequity between the amount of prize money paid to male tennis players and female tennis players. And uh, the USLTA didn't take kindly to the women and basically shut the door on them. The nine, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Christy Pigeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Hellman, uh, Carrie Melville Reed and Judy Taggart Dalton. All nine of them put their careers at risk because they were bucking the system. They were going against the establishment, basically saying to the establishment, hey, you know what? We don't care about you. The establishment said, you go there, we're going to knock you out of the Grand Slam, Slam tournaments. And Billie Jean King said, try it. Just try it. Um, one of the reasons that Virginia Slims became the title sponsor was because nobody else wanted it. Nobody else wanted it. As Billie Jean King told me, we used to bang on doors at Madison Avenue, begging, asking for money. Nobody wanted it except for um, Virginia Slims. And Virginia Slims had that campaign at that time. Uh, Billie Jean King said it was blood money. She knew it was blood money. She knew that smoking could cause harm to a smoker. She knew all about the 1964 United States Surgeon General's uh, recommendation uh, to stop smoking because smoking was harmful to your health. Uh, in 1983, there was a um, group against smoking had a protest in Boston and uh, King is up there for a tournament. And they basically said, why'd you take the blood money? And she said, I believe in the free enterprise system. It's up to the women or the woman herself to make the choice whether to smoke or not. The most important thing is we were well informed and that we make our own decisions. Uh, blood money, Ellen Merlo was the director of marketing communications for Philip Morris USA, which made the Virginia Slim cigarettes. She uh, talked about this during the sponsorship of the tour from 1971 to 1978. When we get involved in any promotion, it's obviously to create a greater visibility for a brand name, but we never ever ask the player to endorse the product. That much is true. They didn't say, tell people you smoke it. However, it was attached to this group, which means this group gave approval to Virginia Slims and to smoking, and they all knew it, but they wanted to get the tour going. They were hoping that uh, the, the Virginia Slims uh, uh, marketing money would disappear real quick. Somebody else would step in. That didn't happen. Brandy Chastain, you might remember her from the 1999 United States Women's Soccer uh, Championship, World Cup for Women's Soccer in 1999. And uh, she and I had a conversation about 10, 12 years ago, and we were talking about the failure of uh, various soccer leagues, including the WUSA, which was the major one in 2001, two years after the 99 championship win, and some other uh, 
leagues that got off the ground but really didn't get anywhere. And I said, how come? How come? How come you can't get the money? In fact, they had a lot of uh, money behind the 1999, rather 2001 uh, league because it featured most of the 1999 women who were on that soccer team. And they had the cable, the cable operators behind them, and they went nowhere, went absolutely nowhere. So Brandy said to me, hey, you know what we need? We need a good old girls network like you guys have, the good old boys network to support us. They're still looking for the good old girls network. Billie Jean King, she told me this story. When she was winning, she couldn't get a credit card. Couldn't get a credit card. Uh, her husband, Larry King, had to sign for it, or her father had to sign for it, co-sign, to make sure that the bills would be paid. Uh, many banks required single, divorced, or widowed women to bring a man along with them to co-sign for a credit card, a brother, cousin, friend, father, father-in-law. And when you, did, when you did get the card, sometimes uh, your wages were discounted by 50%. Um, so they could calculate uh, what the credit card limit should be. But in 1974, the Senate passed the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which made it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their gender, race, or religion, national origin, in terms of giving out credit cards. Uh, there would be a bank that formed. That bank would come in 1975. And uh, it was a bank opened by Judy H. Mello, the first women's bank, and uh, basically came out of the feminist movement, which is uh, Betty Friedan, and uh, Gloria Steinem and Bella Abzug and those people. Uh, it was the creation of that movement. It was established in April of 1975. It was the first bank ever in the United States to be operated by women for women. And the founders said that women were generally given the, sh given the short shrift by other banks. It was time to do something they did. The bank uh, would eventually be gobbled up by somebody else in the 1980s. Uh, the first women's bank was languishing by 1986, and it was sold to a group of investors that strengthened its finances, but the first women's bank name is long gone. Uh, a report from 2012 found that women still paid more for credit cards, according to a study by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Women pay a half point more in interest rates than men. So what exactly is Title IX? Well, Title IX opened the door for women in sports and other fields, including medicine and law. Title IX bars sex discrimination in any educational program or activity that receives federal funding, including athletics. And there is Birch Bay running with the Purdue Boilermakers uh, women's track team uh, after Title IX was passed. Now, I talked to Donna Deverona. This is another quote from Donna. Title IX was a civil rights act applied to education. Uh, basically, it said in law school and medical school, sports was thrown in. Big mistake, Donna says many years later. She's still up at Capitol Hill fighting for this. Sports was thrown in. In retrospect, she said, we just should have said all areas of education and let them assume that meant sports, because sports would become the big problem here. At its inception, opponents of the law argued that girls and women were not interested in elite sports participation, and that opening up new opportunities would not only undermine men's sports, but bankrupt school sports budgets national, nationwide. John Tower, Senator from Texas, 1974. John Tower decides, He's going after Title IX. It's May 20th, 1974. Senator Tower proposes the Tower Amendment, which would exempt revenue-producing sports from determinations of Title IX compliance. The amendment is rejected. But that was only the first. There's more to come. Uh, while the Tower Amendment was rejected, it led to widespread misunderstanding of Title IX as a Sports Equity Act or law, uh, rather than an anti-discrimination civil rights law. Jacob Javits, the Republican liberal senator from New York, was next in line to go trying to destroy Title IX. 
which raises some eyebrows from old timers who remember Jake Javits. Um, I covered the 1980 uh, Senate race in New York with Jake, with uh, El D'Amato, who became a lifelong acquaintance. Uh, and uh, Carol Bellamy was there, Liz Holtzman was there, and so was Bess Meyerson. Uh, the only one I didn't speak to that year was Bess Meyerson. Anyway, uh, Senator Javits submits an amendment issuing the Health, Education, and Welfare Department to issue regulations that provide for reasonable provisions considering the nature of particular sports. It clarifies that event and uniform expenditures on sports with larger crowds or more expensive equipment do not have to be matched in sports without similar means. Therefore, if you were on a, say, a woman's softball team, you could wear hand-me-downs, rags, whatever, you know, uh, and you shouldn't complain about it. Hey, the men in football, hey, best uniforms. Got to have the best uniforms for football. They got to look sharp and they got to look the type. Uh, so that was Javits uh, trying to uh, submarine Title IX. Walter Byers was another guy who tried to submarine Title IX. He was the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association, and his job, his job is to look after student athletes. Of course, his job wasn't to look after student athletes. His job really was to make sure the, po uh, the pockets of colleges uh, at the direction of presidents and chancellors were stuffed with money, TV money, revenue from stadiums, marketing, et cetera, and to make sure that um, no athlete is ever paid and also to keep them as quote unquote student athletes as a uh, rouge or, or as a dodge rather uh, to get around workman compensation laws and, and insurance laws saying, well, hey, these students aren't um, employees, they're athletes. So, uh, February 17, 1976, the NCAA challenges the legality of Title IX. Why? You're supposed to ensure that uh, all the athletes are looked after. Well, there's a reason. You've got to save college football. That's where you make all the money. Title IX has changed how college sports played in the country. Uh, before 1972, the General Accounting Office released a figure showing that 32,000 women had participated in college sports, and within a generation, that grew to 163,000 by 1999. Men no longer get 95% of the dollars earmarked for sports. That's causing friction in the men's team's coaching fraternity. They've watched as men's teams disappeared, and there's more women's teams, and they don't like it. A good number of those coaches think Title IX has taken away their ability to get the best athletes for their teams because they can't spend scholarship money solely for men's teams. Men's sports programs have been eliminated schools, but oddly enough, Title IX was never meant to level out the college sports playing field and give women's sports opportunities. No, nope, not at all, not at all. Title IX's original intent was to give women a fair chance at being accepted at a school and for women professors to get equal opportunities at advancing within the system. Did it work? Sure did. Title IX, by 1994, women received 38% of the medical degrees available in the United States, compared with 9% 1972. So you don't have the uh, dean of school having the women stand up saying, why are you here? and Why are you taking spots for men? 43% uh, of the law degrees compared to just 7% in 1972. 44% of doctoral degrees up from 25% in 1975. That could be a bit misleading because after 1972, it was easier for women to pursue doctoral degrees. So that percentage might have been far less prior to 1972. Title IX has created diversity in society. It's not just a piece of sports legislation. There are more women in medical school today in the United States than men. There are more women in law school in the United States in 2021 than men. And you can see what has happened because Title IX has diversified society and women are in ranking positions. In 1972, Shirley Chisholm, ran for president. She was the first woman to run for president, congresswoman from Brooklyn, who actually spoke at my uh, 
college graduation at Ramapo College in 1977. I don't remember a word she said, but I know she was there speaking, telling us, keep your chins up and keep on moving ahead and you'll succeed. Uh, my friend Shelley, remember I talked about Shelley. Shelley was responsible for uh, Billie Jean King to be carried in the Cleopatra entrance for Rice College University men, uh, putting her on uh, their shoulders with and basically on a plank, bringing her in like Cleopatra, while Shelley also came up with Riggs Pigs uh, and, and found busty women wearing tight shorts uh, with uh, Bobby Riggs uh, and Billie Jean King. But, but uh, Shelley uh, did a lot of work in terms of uh, equity for women, and that's my friend, the late Shelley Saltman, who passed away two years ago, and I miss him still miss him uh, after two years. And this is five years ago in Los Angeles when, uh, when I traveled. And uh, Billie Jean King uh, thought highly of him, thought he was great. And uh, that, that little sexist thing almost never came off because Donald Dell, who promoted it, um, almost didn't have the money. And Billie Jean King, I, I talked to her, said, why were you involved in this made for TV extravaganza? And she said, I don't know. I really don't know. He beat uh, Margaret Court, and um, it just I had to go out there and beat him. I, I said, but, you know, you were in the no-lose situation because if you won, you were 31 at the time. You beat a 55-year-old man. If you lost to a 55-year-old man, they're going to say, how could you have lost to a 55-year-old man back in 1973? And she just looked at me and smiled. You're right. <laughs> I don't know why I did it, but she did. And Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King became very friendly. They were on The Odd Couple together uh, in 1974, and she helped out with some of his medical expenses later on in life. Pre-1972, very few women lawyers, doctors, scientists. I met Rosalind Yellow. She won a Nobel Prize in 1977. I interviewed her in 1978. She was from Riverdale, and she said she really didn't even want to go into the sciences. She just wanted to stay home uh, after World War II and just raise her kids, and her husband pushed her out the door, and she became uh, a noted scientist, noted global scientist. Um, and she lived in Riverdale, and uh, I interviewed her in 1978. Nurses, teachers, secretaries, that was the career destination for most women, that and also being a housewife. Girls didn't play too many sports. Uh, without Title IX, there would be no Jenny Finch in softball, no U.S. Women's Soccer Championship team in 1999, probably no Women's National Basketball Association or the short-lived American Basketball League. There were two women's leagues back in the late 1990s. No Misty May trainer in volleyball, Kerry Walsh, no Lindsey Vaughn in skiing, although there were women skiers. Uh, prior to 1972. So maybe Lindsey Vaughn would have gone ahead and skied. Uh, certainly there were tennis players and golf players prior to 1972. Almost every female athlete in the U.S. today benefited from Title IX in one way or another. So did women scientists, so did mathematicians, so did computer analysts. What is amazing was uh, the hidden figures, the uh, women who were part of the uh, space program in the 1960s, who had major, major jobs uh, with NASA, but were hidden when the brass came around. I have a friend by the name of Dick Hull, who uh, was part of NASA from 1960 to about 1974. He said, they weren't hidden. We knew all about these women who were absolutely brilliant women like Katherine Johnson, and I'm sure you got the book and you got the uh, DVD in the library. So they weren't hidden, they were just hidden when the brass came about. Uh, the United States finally has a uh, woman vice president, a woman speaker of the house. Just think of that. Two of the top three officials in the United States, President Biden, uh, Harris, the vice president, Pelosi, the speaker of the house. Two of the three key leadership spots in the United States today are held by women. And just think, back in 1970, 71, there were some people who said, you cannot have women have equal rights in colleges because that would ruin American education. Women do need to know that education is not a right. 
It's just not a right. It's guaranteed through a federal, a federal law, Title IX provisions of 1972, and it's not perfect. There are some areas that still need to be fixed up, uh, particularly uh, behavior and, and, and crimes uh, on campus and, and other things. But it's far better than it was in 1971. Lyndon Johnson did not give women equal rights in 1964 in colleges. The future, well, you never know. You never know. It's a right passed by Congress, signed into law by a president. Of course, you would think with all the women lawyers out there today that uh, they would be the first ones out there lobbying to make sure nothing went wrong with Title IX. And Donna Deverona is still out there. And Nancy Hogshead is still out there. And Billie Jean King is still out there. They're still out there and they're still fighting. Because as they tell me, the fight's not over. And if you have daughters or granddaughters, I have a granddaughter now, uh, and I'm gonna tell her exactly what I told my daughter. Don't let anybody say you can't do it. It's a federal law that you can. Thank you so much, Allie. Oh, that is Linda Lingle. She was the governor of Hawaii back uh, in the 2000s. It's me and Linda Lingle. Looks like a cutout, but it's not a cutout. That was in Maui, not far from Maui High School, not far from where Patsy T. Mink uh, got her education and was the valedictorian of her school, but could only play half-court basketball. Thank you, Allie, so much for inviting me. Thank you. And no matter which way you watch this, when you watch it, you got to remember, that's an old picture. Take a look. I got one of those old flip phones. Uh, thank you, uh, Ali, for inviting me. Uh, this is International Women's Month, the entire month of March. Uh, International Women's Month started on March 8th in Santa Rosa, California. It's a local celebration of women, and the United Nations picked up on it and uh, declared March International Women's Month and celebrated International Women's Day on March 8th. Thank you again, Allie, for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Seashim Library. And uh, hopefully we will see you again in the future, maybe even in person, depending on when I get shots and COVID-19 is contained. My name is Evan Wiener. Have a great day. We'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.